Sometimes you wish it wouldn't go on. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the September 7, 2016 uh, workshop of the Scarborough Town Council. We're all here uh, today, uh, along with representatives from Martins Point, as well as uh, Attorney Shauna Mueller, who represents the town of Scarborough. Uh, this evening, we're going to have a workshop concerning uh, a, a unique bond uh, issue that is proposed for Martins Point, a 501c3, and therefore eligible under this uh, rather unusual program, which requires town uh, involvement. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Tom and Shauna, and uh, we'll go from there. I thought I'd do uh, a quick little introduction, and then we can get into the folks from Martins Point. Well, I, I didn't know. Yeah, uh, the chair, yeah. I didn't want to disclose that there may be a con. This young man is my nephew, Ben oh. is, um, and so I know he's been involved in sort of this conversation and issue. So I just wanted to disclose that and leave it to the preview of the council about could be a conflict of interest, or perceived conflict of interest. Just wanted to kind of disclose that. Good. So, uh, uh, are you comfortable participating uh, uh, without any? sense of commitment to supporting this or opposing this uh, because of your relationship with your relative? Now he's apparently been telling stories, so actually <laughs> <laughs> something about my, you know, my, yes, I'm good like him. You're totally comfortable. Uh, just for uh, full disclosure, it might be helpful. Ben, what is your the position you hold with Martin Point, just so people understand? Sure. I'm a financial business partner, so I'm an internal finance consultant uh, to all the lines of our business. Uh, does uh, anyone want to comment? Uh, we certainly can discuss, and uh, it's the uh, charter allows us to to vote uh, uh, on this, but we also have the discretion not to take any action and simply accept. I, have no I think we've I think we've um, allowed more in-depth relationships happen than. Than this and this issue, I think it would be premature to not allow Peter to participate in the discussion. So, any other comment? Uh, yeah. So, so um, sure. totally support unless Peter says he has a pecuniary interest. Totally support him participating. I personally think it should be on the record to, in order to give him some cover right. should anything come up because there is a financial transaction that could be critiqued by others, and I think that it should be on the record. And when you say on the record, are you saying uh, uh, I'll, I'll accept the motion? Yep. So if this is a workshop, just sorry to interject, but I mm -hmm. would um, suggest that because you're in a workshop setting that you take this vote on the record during the meeting yeah. before you take action on yeah. the item. Is yeah. That's right. yeah, I advise that Peter offer the disclosure now, just it would be awkward having gone through right. a half hour conversation and then only to have that revealed. So uh, that purpose has been served and then they can make the, form the formalities in the regular meeting. Good. Thank you. Good. So uh, let's unwind this. Uh, Martin's Point is uh, is coming to town. In fact, their building is well underway. It's the 18,000 square foot uh, facility uh, down here on Route 1. Uh, I think you've all appreciate the site. It's right next to Mercedes. Uh, and back in April, uh, I think April or May, I met with a number of folks from Martins Point, um, and they proposed this, this whole concept to help them uh, secure some lower cost financing. And uh, so right on schedule, they uh, knocked on our door about two weeks ago saying it's September and it's time. So uh, fast forward till now, and, uh, there's a, a number of folks and we probably should do introductions before we get too far along. And I think at that point I'd love to turn it over to someone from Martin's Point to kind of uh, walk us through um, generally what these are, programs are all about and specifically what this request uh, has to do with. Peter, would you, Peter, would you take responsibility for introducing the Martins Point people? I'll be glad to do that. Uh, to my extreme right is Bill Daigle, who, like me, is trying to retire <laughs> as vice president. Of, uh, I'm not sure whether you still are or you're a consultant today. I'm a consultant Dick. at this point. Uh, but Dick uh, is uh, the senior member of the uh, 
Martin's Point staff here. We've already uh, met Jen, who is the financial consultant uh, whose brainchild this is, I think. Uh, and uh, Lynn Roberts, uh, Mr. Chairman, to your immediate right, uh, is the, I don't know your exact title, Lynn, but basically Lynn is the, is the practice administrator and will manage this facility. And I'm Peter Garcia, and I'm with Eaton Peabody, and I'm bond counsel. Well, I, have been, I have been chosen by the borrower in the, uh, the bank to do that. Peter, I had asked you, and you were kind enough to provide a, a bit of a, a memo that kind of gave a brief introduction to this, but it may behoove everyone at the table and at home just to walk back through that, uh, just okay, to kind of put this in context. Would you like me to do that? Uh, I think that would be great. Please. First, my compliments on your Churchillian request that this be one side of one piece of paper. <laughs> I think he was that the a first. I, I, no, I think he was the first guy to eat. He right. tried to get Theo Marshall Montgomery to do that, yeah. I, with lack of success, I think. But in any case, uh, it made me stop and think about what this program is really all about, and try to get it on one side of piece of, one piece of paper. Uh, and, and I started with the idea that municipalities, as you well know, and other governmental organizations borrow at favored interest rates because the Internal Revenue Code provides a tax benefit to the lender, and that is exemption of the interest which the borrower pays from their income tax. So they get a tax break and they pass some or all of that on to you as municipal borrowers uh, when uh, Shanna issues an opinion that says it's a tax exempt obligation. Uh, the Internal Revenue Code also provides that privilege for other than municipal projects, and there's a laundry list uh, of which 501c3 organizations borrowing for charitable purposes, which is what we're talking about here, is one. Uh, so that when a municipality like the town of Scarborough wishes to accommodate a, a borrower like Martin's Point, uh, perhaps in order to induce it to invest in your town, uh, it may issue its bonds, they're called revenue bonds, sell those bonds, in this case it would be to Andrew Scoggin Bank in a private placement, loan the proceeds of the sale to the borrower, Martin's Point, under paperwork which says two very important things. First, town of Scarborough will not, under any circumstance, be liable for repayment of these bonds. That's why we call them revenue bonds. And secondly, that the borrower will make sure that all the expenses attendant to issuance of the bond, your council fees, for example, uh, other incidental expenses that you might incur, will be defrayed by the borrower. And going back to what I said earlier about this being a revenue bond, the bond, <coughs> unlike the bonds that you issue to fund municipal capital projects, will not say that the bond is the obligation of the town of Scarborough. It will say that the bond is to be repaid solely from revenues provided by Martin's Point. There is a process which must be successfully completed in order to take advantage of this tax benefit. We're talking about beginning that process tonight with what's called an inducement agreement, which is a, a preliminary agreement which you authorize, which says if everything is done correctly, and that means I have to satisfy Shauna, and Shauna has to satisfy you uh, as we go along, then you will issue these bonds so that Martin's Point will have the benefit of the preferred interest rate uh, because it's tax exempt. <coughs> the process starts
starts here with an inducement resolution and an agreement which has been delivered to you and reviewed by your counsel. From here, we go to the Finance Authority of Maine, which is the gatekeeper for these projects, and they, under statute, must give notice, hold a hearing, and make certain determinations that this is a qualified bond, meaning qualified under their statute, which requires public benefit, which requires that they avoid undue interference with competitors in the state. We'll have to go to a hearing and satisfy them of that. Other than to sign an application that says you've done the inducement and you're willing to go forward with this program, you don't have to participate in that, but that certification must be had before the bonds can be issued. The next step, from your point of view, would be a public hearing. The acronym is TEFRA hearing, at which the public is enabled to comment on this bond prior to your issuing a resolution that the bonds may be issued if and when the certification from FAME arrives, and more important than anything else, your counsel advises you that everything that I've just said is correctly reflected in the documents that are presented to you for the final issuance, which we anticipate would probably happen in December, based on a hearing and final bond authorizing vote by you on October 5th, which we're advised is a regularly scheduled meeting for your counsel. As bond counsel, we're responsible for drafting and circulating all of the documents that the various parties to this transaction need to review and or sign, as we have before tonight. You've seen the package. There will be more of that. Shana will get a copy and have the opportunity to comment, discuss language protective of your interests to make sure that the protection from liability of any sort that I've mentioned is delivered under the documents prior to a closing, which we anticipate will be in December. Great. Peter, you said that this is a preliminary agreement. I might assume that that means that the action that the counsel takes tonight does not bind us. That will come on October the 5th. I don't want to give opinions. I can comment. Let me comment. There is an understanding in the language here that says that the consummation of this bond issue is dependent on the counsel's authorization of the bond issue, which you haven't yet done. So if you decide this is a bad idea between now and that meeting where you'll be asked to approve the bond resolution itself, you can make that change of heart. And I do agree with that. I just wanted to let Shana say it. Shana, I think probably the $64,000 question that everyone has is because of our lack of familiarity with this, we all think of bonds as obligating the municipality itself. Are there beyond just a lack, and we all heard Peter say there is no obligation of repayment on behalf of the town, but are there any other risks that the town is taking? If you could address that, and then people may have specific questions as to specific risks. So this program is used throughout the state, throughout the country, and not in the authority of Maine, but other similar kinds of organizations. And it is commonly used because the issuers of those bonds understand that they really are not taking on liability for the repayment. We pass along all of the risks, regulatory risks, to the extent that they exist associated with this. We'll be passing those on to the borrower as well. That said, I'm always concerned about tax compliance and securities law compliance when it comes to bond issues. So 
it, it is the case that you get on the radar screen with the SEC and the IRS because you're an issuer of bonds associated with this project. So if this project has tax problems or SEC related problems, and I, and I think the SEC problems are diminished because this is a private placement. We're not um, doing an offering document. So that's diminished even still. But but I would just say that you know there's, if there were problems with those um, federal agencies, um, with this bond issue on the borrower side, it would not cast the town of Scarborough in a, in a positive light. I don't. I still don't believe that those agencies would take adverse action necessarily against the town. Um, so, it, if there was something, that's what I would say. I, I still think this is um, a reasonable um, step to take in partnering with the, um, you know, project that you want to have happen where um, you know you can rely on me to make sure that the process is followed as it's required to, to do under the statute and, and other laws. Um, and you know, the only other thing I would um, highlight, and, and I know Tom and I have spoken about this and Peter and I have spoken about this, which is that um, every year there's an additional sort of benefit on the rate that the town of Scarborough receives on its bond issues if you issue fewer than $10 million of, of bonds in a, in a calendar year is the measure. It's the tax code, so it doesn't really necessarily make sense. It's not fiscal year, it's, it's calendar year. Um, that is a limit that we need to maintain from year to year so that we can um, have the, the town have the best opportunity to get the best um, financing for its own capital projects. And in the, these documents that are before you tonight, it's made very clear that um, whatever the structure of the transaction is going forward, um, that this project is not going to put the town at risk of, of um, you know, causing problems with that limitation. Uh, Just like could, in that regard, since this issue, it sounds like we'll close this calendar year, late this year, but still this calendar year, we've already done our borrowing for the year in the spring, so we know exactly how much against that $10 million cap we've already consumed and theoretically the, the balance, if you will, um, would therefore be available um, in this arrangement. Yeah, and, and I think at this point, because I know Peter has more discussions to, to have on his side about what makes sense in terms of timing and size of this, that we, we'll put that off and I just wanted to make sure that the council knows um, we're attentive to that issue and, and we're going to make sure that the, the town is not going to sort of unwittingly surpass that limitation that, that is important for you to stay within. I, I would characterize it as a risk, but I, I think I should probably mention the one thing that, um, that you should be aware of, we are technically legally the issuer. Mm -hmm. and so uh, these monies, whatever that sum ends up being, counts against our statutory debt limits. Right. Now, I have little or no concern about that. Um, currently, as of our spring issue, uh, we're at 2.6 percent and you're allowed by statute to get up to 15 percent of total uh, state equalized valuation. Uh, just to put that into numbers, we have $470 million in bonding capacity. Uh, this is nowhere uh, going to touch that or limit our abilities ourselves. I know around this table there's already some trepidation around the 98 or 100 million dollars that we have currently. So I just would be remiss not to put that on the table, but I don't see that being a limitation whatsoever. Questions? <coughs> so, <coughs> a couple things. First of all, would the FAME ruling insulate us from any tax liability from the IRS? So if FAME authorizes and says it's a valid project, yeah. does that insulate us from any recourse or? Well, so it's not necessarily FAME, and, and Peter, you can speak to this, but as bond counsel, Eaton Peabody will issue an opinion that these bonds are um, eligible to be tax exempt. So that's the opinion on which the borrower and we will rely, and to the extent there's a problem um, with compliance going forward on the borrower side, that has to go to the borrower. Um, and, and in the documentation, we will ensure that that's the case. Uh, do you want to? <coughs> I would just add one thought. In, in general terms, fame, FAME doesn't step between you and Martin's point in terms of yeah. protecting you. FAME approves the transaction, says that it's done in accordance with law, but it doesn't uh, accept any credit risk 
the answer to your question, I think, lies in the documents that we will ask you to sign, which will say there is no credit risk. And I, uh, I, I can't be more absolute in that statement. We won't offer documents to Shauna, and I know she won't offer them to you, unless both of us are satisfied that you have no credit risk, meaning no obligation to repay. I am not talking about the obligation to repay. I'm worried about IRS compliance or issues like that. So if FAME approves the, the program and says that they're either qualified as a 503C, 5013C, um, I would assume, and that's a bad word I know, that the IRS would agree with that ruling and, and that, that interpretation as well. Or is there a potential that even though FAME approves the, the process, the IRS could say, I'm sorry, we interpret it slightly differently after the transactions happens, and now we're in a situation where we have uh, an issue with the IRS. So FAME is not, um, their approval of the application is really underneath, under their state statutory process. So they are really not offering um, <coughs> guidance as to the, ta the federal tax consequences of the transaction. That happens with borrower and bond, and bond counsel. And so it will be in the documentation that um, we negotiate a loan agreement between, um, uh, if you call it a loan and security agreement or how your documentation is, is titled, but there will be a, a significant document that will lay out the relative risks, and in that document, the borrower will, borrower will assume all of the risk and responsibility related to tax compliance. They have to. They're the ones, the, the, the issues with tax compliance that could arise into the future are things like, the facility is not being used according mm -hmm. to what they said that they were going to use it for, and it's not, in fact, a charitable purpose under the code. And if those kinds of things happen, the IRS certainly could take notice, and um, that liability we have contractually agreed is going to fall on the borrower. Um, and that's what I kind of was suggesting earlier that it's not great if that happens to anybody, but it's not great for us, even if we don't have legal liability as a town. We, there will be some negative association um, with us at, by the IRS because of that. So I think that's if, I, if I may offer two thoughts, because uh, I'm much, much older than Shauna. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest concern that I always have as bond counsel, and I think most of my uh, colleagues, including Shauna, who do this, probably would tell you the same, uh, is that the documentation somehow doesn't require or remind the parties of their obligations to mm -hmm. make tax qualification for the entire term of the bond. So if somebody goes out and turns, they go out and turn this place into a skating rink or something like that, something uh, just to use a foolish mm -hmm. uh, but obvious example, that is essentially an audit event. If IRS becomes aware of that, and incidentally the the, uh, the owner should report it, uh, that change of use or some other disqualifying event, then they would, the worst probable consequence is that they would disqualify the deal as tax exempt. They would disallow the exemption, which means now the bank has a tax bill. Mm. And the documents are going to say Martin's Point is going to pay that tax bill which is the primary inducement for our Martin's point to make sure that the tax compliance is correct. They'll sign 40 pages of documents before this is done that say all the things they're going to do to avoid that consequence, but it would not be your problem. And if, for example, auditors did show up, and by the way, in 35 years of doing this, I haven't personally experienced an audit. And all Carol was usually <laughs> the first to make it. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's the first of everything. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a flying squad, by the way, and I think, they, I, I think they pay more attention to more populous areas where bond counsel are a little more aggressive than they are here. <clears throat> but in any case, uh, the documents are going to say that in the event that you incurred some expense, had to had to involve your auditors or involve your counsel in that just to make sure that you didn't have a, uh, an adverse <coughs> consequence, which you shouldn't anyway. Again, Martin's point would be obliged to pay the bill. So, sorry if I could just follow up. Well, what is our obligation then is the bond issuer? Yeah. To issue the bonds in accordance with the agreements, starting with the documents you're authorizing tonight, more particularly with the, with the final authorizing resolutions that will be presented to you in October. 
And that, that document will look similar to what you've seen in the past to authorize the town of Scarborough bond issues, um, but it'll talk about um, this program. It won't be a general obligation bond, it'll be a revenue bond. Um, there'll be some changes in that regard, and it'll authorize um, you know, various town officials to execute documentation, including this loan and security agreement that will provide all the protections that we've been discussing. And, and that loan and security agreement would be on the same agenda. It, we would see that, and, and the council would be approving it before we take that action, correct? Uh, not, you, not usually. Usually the um, issuer adopts the bond resolution, which authorizes the transaction, and then all of the, the closing <coughs> documentation is prepared. Um, and that's similar to, to what we do with the other bond issues where the council says, okay, this is the bond issue that we're going to do this year, mm -hmm. and then I prepare the bond documentation for the town and the, the chairman of the council and the treasurer sign those documents, including the bond, the bonds themselves. Um, so that would happen on the same schedule if, if we were following a, a normal schedule. Um, you know, that not necessarily has to be the case, but I think the idea is that they, we don't want to invest the resources in, in preparing all the documents before the authorization is provided. That's generally the reason for the sequence. Councilor Kettering. Yeah, I have a couple of questions that come to mind. Um, what if the borrower no longer exists? What if Martin's Point goes out of business? Uh, then who's responsible? My other, my other question is, and it probably goes along with that, it's who are the guarantors of the bonds? You know, if you're saying, well, it's not the town, it's not, you know, it's like, well, who is, essentially? Um, also, if the town wanted to go through a similar uh, bonding type situation with fame in, future, in the future, are there limits? Because there may be other projects that we would think this would make sense for. Because I know I've seen fame borrowing, you know, for more unique, shall I say, situations perhaps, you know, with business types of businesses and whatever who go through fame, fame borrowing. Um, and the, my last question is, has Martin's Point used fame for other borrowing? Are there other places where they've, where they're located? Like they, I know they're in Gorham and you know, wherever. Are you thinking if, uh, if they went into through a Through this process, process, through this fame process. Your prior question though was in a... Yeah, the first bankrupt, one is, so who the heck, who the heck backs up the bonds? I mean, I'm not used to seeing money lent yeah. where you don't have some guarantor somewhere. So there, there is, um, I mean, this is a private placement, a placement so Andrew Scoggin Bank has issued a commitment letter, similar to just a commercial right. transaction, and they have laid out what collateral they need in, in that commitment letter, and off the top of my head, I don't know if what is there. I think they need to get a pledge of some sort, I don't, yeah. I'm not familiar with yeah. that. It, ha it has nothing to do with the town, but right. you're right, I mean, there's, right. there's, Martin's Point is on the hook for this in, in a variety of ways. Um, so your question about what if they go out of the yeah, what if Martin's Point no longer exists? If for some strange reason is the answer that we are not a guarantor, notwithstanding risks such as bankruptcy, dissolution. Correct. Uh, right. If that happens, the town is still not obligated in any way to okay. financially contribute to those debts. Okay. If the town wanted to use this same process for any other borrowing down the line, does FAME have a limit on? FAME has a number of different programs. This is the Municipal Securities Approval Program. Right. I'm not aware that they themselves have a limit. It's m more dictated by the town's limitations. Okay. Well, but uh, there's al there are also limits uh, imposed by the federal law. Right. on certain kinds of programs, this one's not subject to one of those limits. Yeah, okay. FAME is one of the gatekeepers. They, they get an allocation yeah. every year from Congress, right. and they parcel it out to your project or my project right. or someone else's project. Uh, but the answer is no, this, not, this project does not limit any other project okay. that you might uh, uh, entertain. So as a follow-up, could we, fi uh, so it sounds like the federal government provides limitations for Maine and then FAME sends out, says this is what each one can use? 
For some of the programs. For some, but not for this not one. Not for this one. This one is limited only to the extent that the 501c3, in this case Martin's Point, yeah. cannot use more than 150 million. There's a, there's so a number limited by the company that uh, there's a limit on okay. the use by this company, which is vastly greater than this bond. Right. But there is no limit on 501c3 bonds in name. So okay. you could do 20 of them if you wanted to. Has Martin's Point ever used this type of financing before? Or? We have never used this uh, particular financing. The only other bond that we did, geez, early 2007, 2001, we have a Mahipa bond. Mm -hmm. Peter, you can remind me what the acronym stands for, but it wasn't for any of our facilities. Um, it was a different uh, debt structure, part of what we inherited when uh, we combined with Bowdoin as well okay. as our other uh, debt structures as well. Okay. But this is the first <coughs> time Mark Point itself is using this vehicle as well. And this is just, and again, <laughs> this is for the construction of the building itself, period, no operational expenses, whatever, whatever, correct? That's correct. That's correct. It's real estate. So it's the real estate and everything would be the collateral that. and probably, too. Yeah. I honestly don't remember. It's in the it's in the papers you were given, but I haven't reviewed it yet. I had a reason to, but it, it includes the, the construction, the equipment yep. of the building, and the soft cost that you normally see for a building like this, uh, engineering, yeah. architectural, yeah. and so right. on, uh, and the cost of issuing the bond. Okay, thank you. And if we say no? What are the options for the Martin's Point financing? Martin's Point could go to FAME and Themselves? ask for the same thing. Yeah, FAME has a similar program. They could potentially cut us out of that process altogether and go directly to FAME. Potentially, yes. Other questions? Yeah. So, um, well, not intention. Um, so, what's the benefit of going through the town rather than going yeah. through fame? Other than the good credit standing of our town, mm -hmm. the credit, uh, uh, credit rating did go up. The, the, credit, the credit standing is not. It's not part of the consistency. It, it, it's not an incentive to the borrower. Yep. Uh, which is not to demean your credit standing. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, the incentive to the borrower, in this case, I think more than anything else, is relationship. Okay. They want to be a good citizen, and you, you have the opportunity to do this, and they've asked you, would you please do it, and we'll bear all the expenses. So if I can follow up a couple yes. of questions. So um, the first is, um, and some of this is our, our recall, because we've had the summer off. Have we had a, um, any information provided to us about the project? and the value of the project to the community, either through economic development or through town government? Um, anything at all? Because I know that there was some conversations about it coming forward, and, uh, but have we received anything, just so I can go back and research about the project? I'm not aware that we've received any progress <coughs> through the planning board project. Yes, okay. I suppose there was some conversation of a uh, projected assessed value or job Why creation. We covered the, the uh, initial investment of the project itself in the construction of the building and the yeah. soft cost. Uh, we talked about more of a relationship, <coughs> a partnership with the community uh, and the creation of, of a community space yeah. uh, that's you know, currently under development. Um, more of that, those types of discussions are in a, a partnership of using the, the space. Yeah. So, so to drive down, has there been a presentation to the council regarding the community space and the value to the community? Not that I'm aware of, no. Other than, than general discussions through the planning board and, and staff okay. to staff has, has had some initial discussions. Right. And there's conversations, as I understand, going on with your current um, senior coordinator with the community as, as far as defining that relationship and, and uh, use of that space. So I, I don't think anything's been defined at this point. Sure. Other than continued discussion to figure out a way to, to, for both parties to benefit by the use of the space. So the reason why I bring that up is that there is a, there's a statement in the memo that says that this is a preferred uh, mechanism or tool for favored, favored private entities or pri private activities. And I think that if this is something we are going to move forward and support, we've worked very hard over the past year in particular to um, be transparent and, and provide greater communication. And I think that we will need to express what the uh, why it's favored, and then why this is of community value for us to take this 
um, take this approach, which is unique. So um, that should be part of it, whether it's included until the final approval but, or after, but it should be done um, so that more in the community understand that. Um, the other question I had was, um, looked at charter and I couldn't find anything really around this because there's uh, always a focus around uh, bond issuances greater than 400,000 or expenses. Um, what are our limitations as a council regarding any, are there any limitations based on our own charter or any other mm -hmm. governances that, you know, control us as a town? No, I mean, the, um, the process for approving bond issues has been, you know, through council order. And I know in general, you sort of by custom do a first reading and a second reading of most items. That's not a requirement in the charter. Um, but that, that was one of the you know, things Tom and I, the, the town manager and I have talked about. Um, other than that, it's, it's sort of statutory level uh, limits on debt, and, and we're just very, very well within those. My, my recollection, the charter is specific um, in reference to general obligation bonds. I don't believe it even contemplates other types of bonds, this being a revenue bond. Well, yeah, so in the absence of any specific restrictions, the council can generally do what it wants by majority vote. Um, I was just getting to, um, so will this include um, two hearings, I'm sorry, two readings and two public hearings, like a few other actions, or is this purely gonna be two readings? I think that the hope of Martin's point is that tonight the council will consider and approving the inducement resolution, yep. which will authorize the town manager to sign the inducement agreement and submit the application to fame and then on October 5th to take final action on the bond authorization. Um, after public hearing. After public hearing um, on that day, right? So that timeline satisfies all the either fame or statutory requirements. Um, if the council wished, you could have a more elaborate approval process. Um, oh, I don't want to complicate it. I just, I, I think that there should be a public hearing dedicated okay. to this. And there will be. Yeah, and it, it shouldn't be. Um, uh, what's the word? It should not be uh, consolidated with the uh, with the, the final action. reading. Yeah. The action. That's I think that there point. needs to be a gap between the two so that there is some input. Um, maybe there won't be any input. I just think that um, uh, that's a, a fairly common. If that's the will of the I just I think that it should be discussed. Yeah. If that's the will of the council. Um, the other question, and the reason is that um, I'm stuck on this favored private activity because I think that while this is very exciting and I understand, I, by the way, I, that's at the very top of my road, so it's um, very welcomed. Um, we as a council, though, need to understand what this sets into precedence and how this will manage going forward for other projects. Um, so from an administrative standpoint, I think we need to take that into consideration. The other question I have is really for Tom, and that is really after the issuance, um, no, excuse me, um, as part of the issuance, does the town get any um, financial benefit um, as far as uh, being able to uh, assess a fee for being the conduit because that's what we are for the conduit for the transaction. Um, do we gain something out of this other than the relationship financially? Um, is this reported on our financial statements? Um, and then the third piece is that do we have the, is there any requirements after the issuance um, on behalf of our management team to um, either monitor, manage, or and, and do we have the capacity and ability to do that? Uh, there's a lot of a lot of questions there. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer <laughs> on the financial statements, frankly. I don't either. I I, I would think that's an auditor question. Um. I, I believe we do have. I'm certain we do have the administrative capability to to uh, continue monitoring this. There will be ongoing responsibilities. Correct. I mean, this loan agreement is exactly what it sounds like. Um, we'll be receiving annual payments and have to, in turn, make those payments to satisfy the, the debt service. Uh, I plan to draw it that, that the payments will be made direct, so that you're not you're not burdened with the accounting and bookkeeping. Even better. <coughs> These are particulars that we yeah. haven't sorted through yet. Um, you know, I had the assurance that any cost associated with this would be covered. Okay. I yeah, I, I'm that. not worried. Really. It's it's more about our ability to manage any post issuance. Um, it sounds like our bonds. our involvement post issuance will be very limited, if not existent. And 
Peter, my my recollection too is, as far as payment re, or loan payments, that is paid directly to the bank and all yes. the Yes, that's the anticipation. So uh, just might I answer a couple of questions? Oh, uh, yeah. Hold your question. You'll be next. Peter, why don't you answer? Yeah. Uh, just be, before no, I fine. forget, because you've raised a number yep. of very good questions, I'd like just to make a couple of comments. Uh, you. Uh, very alertly struck on the word favor that I put in the yep. mem memo. Uh, I want to make sure that you understand that I was not referring to your favor. No, I, I was referring to the Congress of the United States saying these are favored deals, meaning right. we'll let you issue tax exempt bonds for these deals. I'm not suggesting that you should favor Martin's Point over somebody else. No, but um, uh, even if you exclude that word favor, I think our town needs to understand um, when these are um, a reasonable tool for any person coming into town or any person currently in town um, so that it's an incentive across the board and that we're fair and equal to everyone. The other comment that I wanted to offer because you've raised an issue which I've seen raised a number of times before and that is how do we make sure that everybody has a say about this thing and, and then it rests long enough that uh, uh, we can with good conscience go ahead and, and, and approve it knowing that the public has had uh, a good look at it. Uh, the way I draw these things, and I think the way Shauna's office draws these things, if I remember correctly, is to send out a notice that says we're going to have a public hearing on yep. such and such a day. And if you have any comment, please send it to us right now. Uh, which doesn't preclude your right to appear at the, con at the, at the hearing. But then we usually ask people to schedule the action after the hearing. And the reason is these things take give or take 90 days to get done and, and only if you compress to the maximum extent allowed by the law can you even get them done in that period of time. There are a number of periods of time that have to run within the, the process. Uh, that having been said, if you decide that you wanted to have two hearings on this, you could and that's your decision. So is the hearing that you're talking about uh, creating, is that uh, managed by you or is it managed by the town? Is it's it managed a by you? Town, it's a town uh, meeting. Okay. Typically, we, we prepare sure. yeah. the documents yeah. for yeah. approval by your council and your manager, just dist distribution to you or perhaps your chair. Uh, but it's your meeting. Yeah. Peter, it is very common practice for a matter that has, I would say, controversy, but if it's complicated or controversial, that that uh, public hearing and final vote are separated by a meeting, just to allow. Mm -hmm. Further time for yeah. counselors, for public to. It's a relationship case. issue with an app. And if that needs to be, <laughs> we can do it. So in this Absolutely. case, it would be the second meeting in October, the date escapes me, but it would be the. Well, you could do it maybe else. Something like that? Yeah, it is. 19th. Kate. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have to agree with Councillor Baybine. I think it's critical. Um, we owe it to residents of this town who voted into these seats um, that they're getting as much information as possible. I'm going to be very frank. I'm not comfortable. I'm not particularly happy that I'm going to have to vote on this tonight. I knew it was in the um, agenda. I guess I didn't realize exactly what I was getting into. Um, I don't think the public has had enough time. I certainly don't feel like I've had enough time to um, make a vote. I'm happy to know that my vote tonight isn't it can, can be changed, I guess that's mm -hmm. what everyone is saying. Um, but I, you know, I, I always say that I want us to be a business friendly town. That's a big thing for me. Um, you know, the more supportive that we can be, the more streamlined that we can be to help um, companies and businesses come into this town, I think the better off we are. Um, but on the flip side of that, I owe it to the residents of this town to make sure that I'm getting uh, us involved in something that is going to be okay and safe for them. Um, and I'm not at that comfort level at this point. And I just think, I think it's important to be frank and honest. And that's nothing against Martin's point. That's nothing uh, against you, Peter. Um, it's just, I don't know if I'm, I just don't feel like I'm getting all the answers that I need at this point. That's where I am. Other comments or questions? Peter. Just a couple real quick things. I want to just make sure, I think I heard this, but. We've never been asked to do something like this before. Is this the first time it's really come forward? It's kind of innovative. Yeah, not to my knowledge. Uh, Ruth has been right. the finance director for 35 years. I don't believe she's had the occasion either. So we won't have a situation where someone has brought this forward before and said no, and this, so this is, this is new. 
So I kind of echo some of the other accounts. I think going forward of learning, it'd be great to have some criteria for future projects about if we are going to do these types of things, if it does represent some risk to the town, we have a pretty clear statement about what the value is of, of the entities we're trying to partner with, but that can come later. The only other thing I'd ask between now and at some point in time is to, and, and, I, and I think it really echoes what Sean asked, and Tom, I'm not sure, I think I heard you say you're not quite sure yet. I'd like to really understand all the balance sheet implications. How does it get booked? What does it do? What does it do to some of the critical yeah. ratios that we use for borrowing and other things? So I'd like to really understand sort of the financial presentation impact and how that might impact <coughs> our future borrowings or other things we might be doing to do the comparison. Good point. Uh, yeah, which really I'm not sure we fully d dealt with the question of whether there was a rating agency impact right. risk uh, because it's going to be counted as a part of the town's bond right. financing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so is there a risk created by that, which means it increases the bond, but it's, so does the, do the rating agencies uh, have the potential to undermine our rating status? Um, based on this bond issue, I would be very surprised if the rating agency kind of dinged you in that process. Um, you know, I don't personally handle the rating process for the town, the financial advisor does, but I know that um, I can imagine that he would present this as a positive to the overall creditworthiness of the town because of the business activity that's being supported and, and generated. I mean, you know, that's, that's what he would say. I don't know that it would have any impact at all. Yeah. Uh, and, and except tax base. Well, um, maybe getting a little bit of advice from Joe. Sure, our financial advisor and also our auditor. I think I can, yeah. I can in short order get good answers to those two questions. No, I, Chris, I, I, maybe to simplify it, I just want to understand that this eight million goes to our overall uh, uh, credit limit for a certain amount of time. It's not just the one-time issuance. We're going to carry this forward in our on our balance right. sheet for. It's a so declining balance, but yeah. Right. yeah. Sure. Okay. And I think it's really important to be very, very clear. My hesitation has nothing to do with not supporting business or or Martin Point at all. Right. It has to do with making sure that I'm protecting the people of this town. It, for me, it's black and white. Other questions? I was just going to offer that, that another option is, even though Scarborough has not participated in this program before, there are other main communities that, and for example, I know the town of Cumberland has participated in this program just within the last couple of years, and so it might be helpful for the town manager to talk to a couple of town managers who've had experience yeah, with that yeah. and offer that. I think we'd all appreciate that. Yeah. 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 Waterville, Camden, Unity, oh, Westbrook. Uh, there's a there's a host of communities that use these fairly regularly, particularly those with higher ed institutions yeah. in town. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah, we'll Other questions? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, you very much. We'll uh, convene in about a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So Peter, do you work with? Um, oh, I got, now I've got John Cunningham.